Welcome everyone to episode 267 of Just Josh. I'm your host, Josh Pentarosco. I write stuff in, in podcasts. Ooh, today, by your leave, the metal band from England is my guest. This is a little bit of an international week. Um, this So today, uh, it's metal band. It's Andy the guitarist. We have a heck of a conversation here. It actually goes quite a bit. Uh, starting with the next podcast, you're going to regularly hear a little song from this band from their EP, Dun Quiet Shadow. Well, Jim Stalker is going to be the one I'm going to be uh, pumping on the air here. It won't be this episode, but not because I don't have it, but rather because time constraints. This is a very long but awesome interview, and I want to make sure it's all here. Um, but before we get to that, uh, I'm going to be giving away another copy of Wicked Initiations by Jennifer Ron. I'm going to be giving away this week By Your Leave, The Unquiet Shadow. And I'm going to be giving away um, more video game stuff from Giant Beard Games. That's going to be the good things this week. Definitely check this stuff out. At the giveaway link, just put your email in, and if I draw you, I will definitely send you something. For CD in the book, can in the United States only, but for the video game packages, that's worldwide, so anyone can enter. All right, let's get to our conversation and go from there. Just Joshing is sponsored by Indie Imprint. Indie Imprint brings your creations to life. They believe in indies helping indies, and they have been known to, to contribute to everything from game jams to NaNoWriMo and everything in between. As a creator, you just bring your work to them, whether you're a writer, you're a musician, or video game designer, or whatever the case may be, and they'll help you format, proof, and distribute your project to a variety of different avenues. For more information, check them out at info at indieimprint.com. And by Jennifer Ron, author. Jennifer is re-releasing her fantasy series, Legend of Tenlock, with her first book, Wicked Initiations, coming at When Words Collide. Uh, She's also been released to Dark Quarter, courtesy of Bunder and Press. Uh, you can contact her at longativitythesis.ca. That is worldwideweb.longativitythesis.ca. All right. So it's official, my friend. The recorder's on. If you have anything incriminating you'd like to say, make it good. <laughs> All right. I'll try. Oh, you'll try? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love that. you just like, eh, hey, whatever. I'll just I'll say something good. So... <laughs> I am with... Might as well just introduce yourself, man, in full. Yeah, absolutely. I'm one of the representatives of Buy Your Leave, a metal band from Newcastle upon Tyne. Currently doing an album, which will hopefully be out in November. And, yeah, it's good to be here. All right. So, for the, um, your name is specifically? Uh, Andy. Andy. So, what's, what's your role in the band? Uh, I am... Um, the guitarist i do a lot of the social media um i do some of the booking um a lot of the online stuff i do video creation this that and the other oh wow so, you, you, so i so i do a lot of the stuff outside of playing as well so so basically uh you're the one man you're the one man social media promoter it sounds like it's hard work but yeah <laughs> Well, no, it, it it really is. Um, social media, just the way it is today, it's everybody's saying something. Like it's like every, it's like the thing about where all the social media is. You, everybody's saying something. Buy something. Buy my book. Listen to my music. Look at my illustrations. And so you, your job is to figure out your way how to, have to stand out and all that noise. Yeah. Am I okay just to plug somebody briefly? They don't oh, know me and I, and I don't know them, but, but they've been a real help. Uh, hey, hey, listen, knock yourself out. I, this this is your interview. You can talk about whatever you like, man. Great. There's a, there's a guy I follow um, on YouTube. He did a book called The Rule Breaker's Guide to Social Media. And he used to be the owner of a music college in Brighton called BIM, which was a £20 billion a year business. He's now moved away from that. And he's got Damien Keys, and he does a lot of YouTube content. It's all free content, but it's all, how do I get my band out there? How do I release this single? What do I do after the album's out? And he's been a, he's been a great help to me. He's been a lot, a lot of help to my friends over in Dream Troll who are absolutely amazing and yeah man he's just been a great creative 
influence, so... It's working, apparently, so... Yeah, it looks to be. looks to be. We've just had a couple of shirts go to Brighton. Sorry, not Brighton, Bristol, Nottingham. Did your package arrive? Not yet, way, no, not yet, that? not yet, but then I am in Canada, so I'm expecting that to go a little slow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, uh, straight up, man, I, the moment the package arrives, I will let you know, like, immediately. I, I've actually been kind of, I've been actually, every time I've come home from work, my day job, I'm like, did it come? Aw. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the indie imprint guys have been very supportive, and they pay, they sorted all of this out right, so. Yeah, no, it, they've, been, they've been great to me. I, uh, for me, this was an accident. Like, uh, as of a literally, like, we were talking literally a week ago, they came to me and they, um, I supported one of their authors, all right? Uh, yeah. Because he's, he's, he's a friend of mine. And uh, they went to me, it's like, dude, we would love to sponsor you regularly. Sure. <laughs> it, That's it, great. It, yeah, well, you know, I... I Apparently, I'm good at this. I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure how it got that way, but apparently, people think I'm good at my job. So yeah. So all, all I've been doing since I won an award for my podcast last year, a, a pretty big one in uh, Canadian science fiction and fantasy. Brilliant. Yeah. So I just been taking the opportunities to um, use it to build myself up. It gave me credibility, and. The big thing, too, and I've said this off the air to some people, awards are great, but it's what you do with them. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, I don't know what it's like in the literary world, but in the music world, a lot of people don't know how to self-promote or market. Um, there is a, a site, there's a blog that I follow called Games, Brains, and Heavy Metal Life, which does metal music, it does films, horror movies, low budget B grade stuff so not anything like I don't know like Evil Dead wouldn't be on there but Leprechaun 17 would be and they're really great they've been very supportive of a lot of bands I know but the bands aren't sharing all their reviews and stuff which which I is, don't which, is, which, which sounds really good no uh, self promotion super hard um, yeah for sure yeah, because you have to, like, I actually equate it, like, I, I've said this in other interviews, it's kind of like pro wrestling. Like, especially, like, the old, yeah. pro, uh, like, the old pro wrestling. Metal, I imagine this is actually even more so the case than, than anything else, because you guys, you guys, like, are, you guys have to be on the stage larger than life. Like, on some level, you have to be. Yeah. Right? Um, it has to be you guys. That's, like, 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 the, the balance I find with promotion is... You have to find the balance between uh, standing out and being authentic. It has to be something you guys can believe in, and it, because if you guys can't, the audience won't. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's a solo artist called Lewis Capaldi in the UK, and he's he's just hit the big time because he's funny. Yeah. You know, he does Snapchat videos, which are absolutely hilarious. I'm not into his music, but there was a, a thing that happened with Noel Gallagher from Oasis. This kid, I don't know who he is. He, he sounds a bit rubbish. Yeah. So he came out at Glastonbury wearing like all the Oasis gear from the 90s, took off his Parker jacket and had a shirt with a love heart and Noel Gallagher's face on it. Okay. <laughs> and I just thought... That's brilliant, and in the pop world, it's just nice to have like some sort of personality. Oh, you need it. Like, like you, you absolutely. Like you need it. Like it's not okay so because we are we are we're in a more interactive age. Like, like, like okay, like yeah. Th th there's let's let's be sort of like the surreal part for me. Okay, we are literally what six thousand miles away from each other right now. Like literally, yeah. right? And we are talking. Right, and yeah. that's a that's a cool thing. Like, I'm not I'm not taking this for granted at all. But the fact is that that goes to show you that accessibility is there for us yeah. all, right? So, yeah. if I get this opportunity to meet by your leave, I want an impression of who you are. That probably matters more now than it ever did. Does that yeah. make sense? 
Yeah, I mean, I know you were talking about being on stage and, and having to be larger than life. Yeah. But there's a there's a British comic by the name of Stuart Lee who, when he's on stage, he has this character of Stuart Lee. Yes. Who believes him to be like this smug comic and he, he doesn't understand why people have brought their friends along to his gigs. But the, the most important part that he has is he tries to give this illusion that the show isn't structured. Yes. But it's been carefully written from start to finish to end. And and that's what kind of what we try and do. Um, we have a song which isn't out yet. It will be out, I hope, in September. Uh, waiting on the video files to get back to me because we were filming. Oh, cool. And we, we have swords and this, that and the other. Because like, if it's, if it's the last song of the night you want to make it big you know you want people to go well i'll see these guys again so that that's what we try and do we try to leave a lasting impression hopefully it's working yeah well, well i i hope so too I, I and i wish you all the best of luck i i've actually uh been a uh, been amazed like for me like i i've been listening that like just strictly on a metal level i've been listening to more metal from europe uh i just listened oh, right. uh, yeah so i just listened to uh a spanish band called warg Right, they they were really cool. I loved their sound. I I always loved the German metals. Like I love my I love me the Nightwish. I love me the Amon of Mars. I love me the I, yeah. I right right. I like metal over in your part of the world is so fucking cool. It really is. Yeah, I mean, the the thing with us is we are the European flavored band. I mean, sure, the drummer likes bands like Black Dahlia Murder, who are one of his favorite bands, and they're great. Yeah. But but I was always more into bands like Halloween and, and Grand Magus and Nightwish, as you rightly said. But here's the thing that I don't understand about this music is there's a big scene in Botswana. Really? There's a huge scene in, in Botswana and there's a huge scene in Iran as well where they're living under, well, not so much in Botswana, but certainly in Iran where they're living under these governments that will kill you if you, they find that you're listening to this stuff and I and I just find I mean there's a there's a great documentary that Sam Dunn did and I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head but metal's universal and it's, it's worldwide and I can't believe it you know uh, I, I can't okay okay so here's the thing about like I find okay I'm a science fiction guy right yes right I'm so, a, right I'm a science fiction guy and the thing about science fiction is it speaks of the possibilities of tomorrow, right? And it, and it reflects on the feelings and thoughts of today. And it's like, well, what if the, what is the natural progression of these feelings and thoughts going forward? I'm working on two novels, right? Like, I just handed in my, my novel I'm going to be releasing in the fall to my editor for that last polish round. Right, so it's done. Yeah. But I'm already looking at the next ones in the series, and it's I'm writing about um, trans themes because I'm looking at body modification and what the future of that would likely hold. Okay. Right, because it, it's it's, it, it, it's a good time to write something like that because we're we're, yeah. we're we're literally at that point where we're experimenting with human beings and we're at what how far can we go and still be human? That's a legitimately good question right now. You know what I mean? So, yeah. metal... Now, here's the thing about metal. Metal gives listeners permission to be aggressive. One of the coolest things I love about going to a metal show is the mosh pit. Because it's got such an interesting code of honor, for lack of a better term. Like, I can be... I can go against another grown person, and I can hit him, as long as I'm not cheap-shotting him in, like, the kidneys or something like that. I can yeah. hit somebody. But... Here's the thing, if I go down, or they go down, guess who's picking them back up? Me? Or them? Right? It's like, it's like, metal, metal has this, has this very powerful community aspect to it, where anyone can belong. So people that feel isolated and oppressed, and feel uh, alienated, can actually kind of find a way to come together with something like this. Which is, always, which I think is one of the most fascinating things about metal is music number one number two yeah right 
it's almost like, again, when I listen to, listen to metal, I have permission to be angry. I have permission to be not necessarily violent, but I, I, I can let those impulses out in a relatively healthy way. Yeah. Right? So I could see why in a place where if you felt oppressed or in a place where you felt um, unwelcome, you'd quietly be sneaking in Man of War on, on, at night. Or you'd be listening. <laughs> I, 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 and yeah, it's not, it, sounds yeah. Silly, it sounds silly, but... We all need, we all have, um, we all face pressures on some level, no matter where you are, there's always struggles. And you need outlets for that stuff. You, you really do. And metal's great for that. Like, I, 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 uh, about three years ago when I started doing interviews, I found people that d- embrace certain, certain aspects of that stuff. Oh, I do. Right? They're, not, they're the nicest people in the world. Like, they really are. Yeah, that's what you tend to find. I mean, going back to your point about um, the community aspect and things, there was a guy who set up a metal festival for his son. I think it was cerebral palsy that the son had. And it was a place where, like, the the kid could be himself. Like, he he loved Metallica, for instance. And that's something metal does so well. You know, when I was at Bloodstock, I haven't been for years, but it was one year, I remember it vividly. There was a guy in a pit who was in a wheelchair. Yeah. And and I just kind of thought, this is what it's all about. I mean, I've distanced myself away from Bloodstock ever since they've claimed to be a tolerant festival and they've been using Sophie Lancaster now for anybody who doesn't know about that that was quite a big thing because she was killed because she was a goth essentially and the festival has basically ridden that wave for so long and her mother's involved with the festival there's a Sophie tent every year which is great but they then put bands on like Tark and an Emperor you know, who Emperor, there was a the drummer murdered a gay guy and claims that that wasn't any part of it and Tark have been you know, they've been wandering around stages with swastikas on their chest and having anti-Islamic lyrics and it's it's hardly the epitome of tolerance Yes. you know, which yeah. is, I mean, Tark are headlining the Sophie stage this year and for me, metal's all about there isn't any borders. People can just be who they are, and and if people don't want to accept that, you know, just find another genre. You know. I I, I hear you. you want to hear my fun wheelchair story? So absolutely. Uh, Amon and Mark came to our came to us, and they we're doing a show, and <laughs> so they so they did their encore song. I remember this. Yeah. They did their encore song. They left the stage. We were still wanting more. So, so they literally came out again. They'd actually look at the arts, like you know, because we had the, we were shaking the building. It was like it was a it was a fun crowd, man, to be a part wow. of, right? So yeah. they went up and did one more song on top of their encore song. And I remember as going through the last song, which was uh, their their Thor their their, their their Thunder God song, right? I get beamed by a wheel, and I look up, and there's this person in a wheelchair, literally getting crowd surfed to the front. I couldn't believe it really? when I was, oh yeah, I'm serious. I couldn't believe it. It's like, holy cow. I did not, like, first off, no one, you don't accept to get beamed with a wheel. Like, you just don't, in the head. And, and, and I know listen, the audience listening to this, it, this sounds incredibly like, why would you enjoy that so much? Because when you look up and you literally see someone in a wheelchair having the time of their lives going to the front of the stage, you can't be mad at that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I saw Hatebreed um, at Bloodstock again. I, I think I'd just seen them a couple of weeks before in France. But Jamie Jaster is such a sound guy. He, he got this kid up and his dad on the stage. And it was halfway through their set or something. And he was like, this is what metal should be about. Yeah. You know, there, there should be that kind of family aspect. And, and kids are... I, I don't even, I'm so old, <laughs> I'm only 25, but I don't even know what the kids are listening to at the moment. 
Oh, it, it, uh, you know? I, I, I don't, I don't even worry about about that anymore. I mean, I, I'm 37. I am way past the point of being cool. I, I've, <laughs> not, I've long, I've long learned that you, you, you're, you're coming to that age, and I've got it. I sound so old. I feel really, really terrible about this. But anyways, you're coming to the age where you just, you, you're because you're so busy doing your own thing, right? You don't yeah. have time anymore. Like you just don't. You want to pretend to be hip and cool, and you, you, right? But the reality of the situation is there's so much going on, and you're doing so much yourself just to do what's relevant for you. Yeah. Right? You just don't have time anymore to go, hey, what's in, what's out? Like, no, you, no you're done. That doesn't mean you're not fans of stuff. That doesn't mean you won't have time every now and then to go enjoy something else. But let's be honest. I mean, you got music to make, videos to produce. you got you got places to go. A shows to perform. It's no longer um, your 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 best bet to actually get to enjoy something else is when you're on like a show, like a big like a bigger show where you're sharing yeah. with with a bunch of other bands, and that's where you can still be a fan. You know what I mean? It was yeah. I mean, it was like when I was ten, I saw Megadeth for the first time. Nice. And I saw I saw them with they were doing a UK tour with Judas Priest and. They played my area without Priest, but with Testament, and that's and Testament rightly blew Megadeth off stage. Yes, I, and I've always I've always said this, but that's when I realised that this is something I wanted to do. Like when kids were getting drunk at prom or whatever they called it back when I was sixteen, I was sitting at home watching Alien, watching Blade Runner, um, watching reading Philip K. Dick, reading Asimov, reading Alistair Reynolds, you know, it was like... It, 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 dude, I, I still want to have a beer with you and just geek out on science fiction forever. Yeah. <laughs> That's... Yeah, man. And it was like, that was the kind of world I wanted to be a part of. I mean, I didn't I didn't discover things like... Um, I, didn't, I didn't discover the fancy stuff, Tolkien, George R. R. Martin until later just because sci-fi was what I'd always kind of been brought up with yeah with like reruns of like Blake 7 and Doctor Who and early Star Treks and things so that's kind of where a lot of my writing comes from and that's cool like honest, honestly yeah, absolutely. I, I, that's really cool For, first off I popped when you said Asanoff I love Isaac Asanoff he's one of my favorite yeah He's one of my favorite science fiction authors. Um, my personal favorite of his, though, is his short stories, uh, particularly Nightfall and The Last Question. But I also love Foundation. I love that series so much. Yeah, I was going to say, I haven't read Foundation for a long time. Not since I was about 16. But it, it was really cool because it was filled with hard sci-fi. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not filled with... It's not Star Wars, which was just a Western in space. Asimov was kind of, this is real, this is grounded. Well, and I like that. Uh, well, uh, well, the cool thing about Asimov, this is the thing I, I really like. Like He had, he was the epitome, I think, of balancing hard science fiction with storytelling. Yeah. With storytelling, period. Because he would take the time to explain a concept... But I even now to this day I, I, I the closest to him today is Robert J Sawyer, a Canadian author based based over here, right? Yeah. But even even Sawyer, as much as I, I don't think he'd mind me saying this, um, Asanoff was just so good at explaining his concepts to just anyone could get them, like anyone, and sure. and, and he could still and he, he would still tell his story, and it wouldn't be page after page after page of scientific accuracy not that he wasn't scientifically accurate but he was so knowledgeable of his stuff he made it part of the story in a way that didn't feel like he was just explaining things to you for sure and that's just an example of world building you know yeah. I, I'm really getting into Dark Souls at the moment which you know for people who don't know it's a, it's a video game dark fantasy and a lot of the world building in it is so kind of minimalist. So it's it's all filled with like item descriptions and environmental things and but it doesn't kind of 
it's such a smart game. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't do what I feel like Asimov sometimes does, and it's kind of like, if you're not paying attention, you'll miss something. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Dark Souls, it's like, if you don't pay attention to something, you'll, you might miss it, but it won't really matter in the long run. Uh, that, that's Which actually... what I really like. Oh, I, that's one of the few games I will not play online. Oh, man, players are bastards yeah. in that game. <laughs> they are just <laughs> bastards. <laughs> because yeah, it's just like, sure. go here, go here, and then you go there and you just die horribly. Like, whoever thought this was such a dick? But, I mean, it's part of the game. It's, it's actually a really great game. For me, uh, yeah. the game I'm playing right now when I'm not doing any of the crazy stuff is Persona. Persona 5, to be specific. Oh, yeah. I love that I've game. Not, I love that I've game. Not I've not played it yet, but our vocalist is very into Persona. Oh, I, I think uh, I, I would love your vocalist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah but, he's great. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd love your vocalist. You know, it's it's that you want to talk world building. That game, yeah. like any of any of them, three, four, or five, the world building's just fantastic, and the story, like the characters, they're all incredible. Like it's just like okay. wow, like they put a lot of detail, time, and effort. So Persona Three is about facing mortality, and how how it, like ultimately it's about dealing dealing with death, the fact that people around you are going to die one day, and the fact that you yourself are going to die one day, and how yeah. you, who are you in those moments when these things happen, and these are incredible characters. I like the game is not as good as four and five, but I love that story. Okay, right? Four is about dealing with deception. It's a murder mystery. But it's also like it's it, it's also the best parts. It's almost like it's the closest thing to Scooby Doo they've ever done. But oh, right, okay. right, right. It's very it, it, right. It has a bit of that aspect to it, but it's a little bit more. It's a lot more serious too. It deals with the nature of deception in the world, the lies we tell ourselves, and the lies people project about themselves. Which is and again, very intelligent, well done uh, thing. I'm playing five right now. Five is about the idea of um, having to conform, having to conform to things that aren't necessarily just, right? And be and what would you do if you had the power to to uh, change that? And it's it's really yeah. really it's like and these are video games with these incredible stories. You know what I mean? And I'm like, that's why I love the Persona series. So. That's me. I mean, here, here's the thing with, I mean, I've never played Persona, but I will look into them, but a lot of the games are, like, so expensive over here, it's, it's oh, uh, pretty insane. I, 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 I've, I've, I've seen, like, 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 yeah. you, they don't let you guys have cool shit, they just don't. No, it was like, it's like, I went hunting for a copy of Demon Souls, and it was expensive when I finally found it, but in terms of world building and stuff... It's really cool because video games have kind of tran transgressed past the point of, you know, Doom. Yes. 95. I remember reading a Doom review, which was, it's an infamous review, and I can't remember who wrote it, which was, wouldn't it be cool to talk to the demons? Yes. Uh, and I'm, I'm sitting here playing at the moment, I'm playing Fallout New Vegas. Okay. And that has just got so much incredible writing and storytelling, and Obsidian just know what they're doing. I mean, they made Knights of the Old Republic two, which is one of my favorite Star Wars games ever. Oh, Knights of the Old Republic! Oh man, that's such, no, that's such a wicked like Knights of the Old Republic in general is just wicked. So yeah, yeah. But it was great because because in the sequel they they talk about these ideas quite quite heavy philosophical stuff and I always remember this idea of you've just helped a you've just helped a beggar so what happens next does somebody come in and take whatever the guys you've just given this guy or does he you know not do anything with it or whatever and it's all about kind of making choices and, and thinking about them and that hit me hard when I played Nights too, you know. Well, it, the thing, the, okay. So here's the thing about video games. I love about like if we're talking strictly on a storytelling level. Yeah. See, it, it, video games are kind of like the link between what you do and what I do. 
Like you, yes. okay, you right? That they're, they're, they're the link because I tell stories with books. I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna write stories about you know. I joked about this on the last episode I put up there about a a, a pirate a, a pirate and a drunken whale and how they write pirate ships for <laughs> for for, for, oh, for booze. Yes, and in, uh, so I'll tell you the actually I'll tell you the whole thing. That's the fair. That's the story within the story. So the story is about a girl whose dad just got thrown in jail because he did some terrible things. And him, her, a zombie monster, and a unicorn that farts rainbows are going to try to break him out of prison. Yeah, right? But the parallel is this pirate story. So every chapter has a bit of this pirate story. So the first chapter, the pirate is inside the whale trying to figure out how to get out. And it, and it starts talking to the whale. Right? Yeah. And they form a partnership. And she and then it goes back to her in, in high school kind of being ostracized by everybody else because her dad's a crook. Right? So, she meets the unicorn that farts rainbows, right? Because that, that was the last person her dad gave her. The unicorn's a spam bot, a surviving spam bot in the far future. And they form kind of a, part, they form kind of a partnership. It's not quite the same thing, but it, it's, there's, there are parallels there, right? And she, go, she makes the decision that she's going to try to save her dad. And, but as she goes through the story, and as the pirate goes through his story... It's about it's about um, it's it's really about recognizing people for who they are and loving them anyway. That's what the story is ultimately yeah. about, right? Now I can only do that with words. Maybe if I'm lucky, I find someone that can do some pictures. But you could, now let's say I got you guys to do a song a song about a pirate, a whale, and a girl and a unicorn. Now it's a multi level interactive thing, right? Now yeah. a video game does interactivity better than what I can do. Um, not necessarily better than what you guys can do. But it's different. Right? That you, The audience is playing a game, whereas with you, the audience is listening along. And that's a really... And video games have evolved to such a point that there's so much to them. And that they're... Yeah. They are... I think unstilled is a large part an unrecognized art. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. We've had this discussion about video games being art for a long time, and jury's still out. Yeah, but but I will say this: back the, so back in like, when Doom was released, there was this game called Earthbound. Have you ever played it? Uh, I've not played it, but I've heard about it. You want to talk about games ahead of their time in terms of story and dialogue and everything? That's a game you should try. It will blow you away. It was a missed classic. The game did not sell very well when it when it came out, and you will play it. And after about about after about thirty minutes, you will wonder why. It is an amazing game in terms of story and world building, and it's wild. The things you you deal with are just like it's insane. It's crazy and yeah. fun, and you want more. So that's cool. Yeah. I mean, but in a way, though, I was thinking about this the other day. There are things that different mediums are good at. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like when I read. The Killing Joke, Alan Moore's Killing Joke, just because it was the first one that popped into my head. Oh, that, that's a fantastic book. I have one. It, it, it's so good, but if you look at the panels, and if you look at Brian Bollard's artwork or the, and the colouring and things, everything's been placed in those panels for a reason. Yes. There's this fantastic shot of Gordon, Commissioner Gordon, and Batman walking through Arkham Asylum, but there's this panel of Two Face. And he's smiling. Yes. And it and it looks like half of the Joker and half of Batman kind of symbolising their relationship. And I, I, for me, like when you try and do those kind of things in a book, I guess sometimes it could get a little bit messy. But you know, it's well, comic. I'm a big comic guy. I love comics. So yeah. killing. First off, Grant Morrison ruined the Killing Joke for me in a good way. He, <laughs> no, because he talks okay. about he talked he talked about the end of the book, and he pointed out that Batman actually kills the Joker at the end of the book. I'm like, no way! And you read the back of it. No, that actually makes sense. It actually does. If you if you read it, you're like, and you look at the very end when they're both laughing, 
and yeah. the, the ha, the last ha, just kind of fades into the background. And you're like, oh my god, there is a legitimate argument that Batman killed the Joker in this in this story. You can make an argument that this is the like the last great Joker story right then and there, and you're like, holy shit, it works. Yeah, I mean, I'm not that familiar with Grant Morrison's work. I've got a couple of his books. I've got WE3, which is depressing. Oh, yeah, that is a very depressing one. You, the one, okay, so I'm reading The Green Lantern by him and Liam Sharp. Oh, yeah. Um, Liam, I've known I've known Liam's work since he did a book called Testament. I love this run on Wonder Woman with Greg Rucka, and I'm loving okay. this run of Green Lantern. Like for me, I'm a big Green Lantern guy. It's like just I've been a Green Lantern fan since I was eight. So I've been I've been a fan for a long time. I have Sinestro's first appearance, like legit as the comic where he first. Oh, wow. showed, yeah, I'm a big fan. So when I'm reading this run of Green Lantern, I get a lot of the in jokes because I read that run. Right, he started hearing yeah. about stuff. He's writing about stuff that came out initially in the fifties and sixties, and I would ar- and I would argue that also Green Lantern number seven might be the best, one of the most interesting love stories I've ever read. It would shock. It's shocking how um, how he did that. It's an amazing yeah. book. You could not do that book that way if it was just prose. Prose's prose's advantage is is over all over most mediums is the fact that I can create prose is about like what isn't said. It's not not about what is said, it's about what isn't said in that environment because in those moments um that's where the imagination clicks in. Right? Okay. Co- right? Because it's like okay, if I meant if I talk about um if I want to convey a characteristic of somebody, like uh, one of my favorite things I've ever written, it's not, it'll never be published. I had this scene where this one brother wants to kill the other brother. And the temptation is, right, he wants to go out and exact his revenge. Like, instead of waiting for him to come. But then he realizes that the, that the, be- the longer he waits, the more satisfying it would be to do it this way. It's a really sinister, it's a really sinister chapter, right? But the whole story is the inner turmoil between trying just like satisfy scratch that itch now versus the the actual like enjoying it later and getting more out of it which one which is the more pleasurable thing so there are things i say that convey like that desire to go out and do something and what he does tells something about his character that's what prose does prose is all about um um the nuances Right? Yeah. Right? Comics have the ability to do words and pictures together. So, comics is about time. The illusion of time passing. And what happens in those moments. Right? Right. Music, um, well, you, you, you like, you, you would know this better than me. It, it's, it's probably, to me, it's not just the words. I think the important thing in music is the melodies or the lack of melody or the harmonies. Or Absol- the, right? Absolutely. Right? That's the stuff that really conveys to the audience um, what's really going on. The lyrics can add something to it yeah. for sure, but it's, 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 again, it's the harmonies, it's the symphonies, it's the ability to convey an experience with sound. That is music's true beauty. Yeah, for sure. I mean, in music, we always, at least internally in the band, we always think about how are we going to put this together? We have a, we have a song, actually, which is going to come out. It's going to be the singles for Hand of Fate. But what's happened is I, I felt like it was getting really repetitive. And what's happened is I've come up with like this new chord progression over it. Nobody has to change anything they, they're playing or singing or whatever. But the experience is so different because of whatever chords have been used. We talk about this concept of tension and release in music quite a lot. Where, say, you play something like a dominant seventh chord which is 
essentially what you would hear in any blues song. It, it it's the clashing of, of two of the notes which creates that tension. And it's all and that's what it's all about and, and the music's the most important bit for us. The lyrics, well they just go on top. Yeah. If if we if we're not creating, because we've we've actually been, it's really weird because we've been compared to so many different bands. Um, we've been compared to Venom for some reason. I'll take I'll take the compliment, but we don't sound anything like Venom. Um, Skyclad, we've been compared to like atmospheric type bands, which is great because that's what we want to do. But it's all about creating something that the audience can kind of go maybe I felt uncomfortable with this bit I really liked this bit I felt excited by this you know it's it's trying to get a reaction out of an audience and that's what we're conscious of doing so okay so I have, I have an interesting question for you okay that, or, because this is something I, I recognized as I've gotten older and Maybe wiser. Well, we'll leave we'll leave the wisdom thing up to some somebody <laughs> smarter than me. But um, one of the things I do in my art now too is I deliberately make some things dirty, nasty, right? Okay. And, like like um, I'll put p- bits in that directly make you feel uncomfortable, and they don't feel perfect um, because it it feels more authentic. So it all it, it it's. I try not to be so so polished in my in my style that that although it's clean and it's amazing, it no longer feels real. Is, do you get where I'm kind of coming from with, with this with like with you guys' music? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for for me, you can be authentic and be really really dirty with your with your production quality with your chords or whatever. I mean, just look at. Immortal had a wonderful album called Pure Holocaust, which is half an hour of just raw black metal. It is second wave black metal in its rawest and purest form. But it's but despite the fact it sounds like it was recorded on a potato, it's across as being really, really authentic. And we, we try to do that as well. I mean, we try... Okay, sure. With the new album, the recording quality is going to be so much better, and it will be polished. But we're hoping that it it doesn't kind of come across as too polished. That all the life's gone from the record. No, no, I, I get no. Don't get me wrong. Like polish is important. Uh, that like that. Like, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be polished at all. Although sometimes, again, it's all about what you're going for too, and, and what you're expressing. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, one of the most interesting compliments I got on my podcast is I don't know how many of them you've listened to, but there are some where you actually hear orders getting taken. There are some you hear that um, other conversations interrupt a conversation, and I leave that oh, stuff. That's cool. Well, I leave that stuff in there, right? Because I, I'm doing interviews in coffee shops and bars and other places like that, right? And if we had, if I could meet you, we would probably be in a pub or we'd be in a coffee shop or. Um, something like that, and we would have, we would go in the background of people taking orders for like for what we're doing, maybe a random conversation here and there. Uh, I leave that stuff in there because it feels real, because it happens, right? We go out, so we bump into somebody, maybe somebody you know, you say hi, right? Maybe you know somebody goes, "Would you like fries with that?" That's real. Like we go through that stuff every single day. Um, so I don't I don't consciously delete that stuff. So when I listen to like some other podcasts, right? That kind of stuff's usually taken out. But yeah. But because I don't, it stands out. It feels realer. That doesn't mean I don't edit stuff. It just means that I don't always I try to keep it I try to keep it more as is. Unless I'm getting yeah. unless I can unless I can be sued for it. Then I then I yeah. take it out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for sure, that was a that was a point. I'm gonna go back to Damien Keys for a second here, yeah. but that was a that was a point that he brought up, which is essentially, I I see it. Damien Keys sees it as well. We see a lot of bands who all of their social media content is 
you know, it's polished to perfection. And one of the biggest ironies that I've ever faced as somebody who does social media is the things that often get the most reactions are the things that have like mistakes in them or it's, it's done from a camera phone in landscape, not these well-produced and polished videos. And I think that's kind of what people like as well is, is for things to feel authentic and things to most importantly feel real. Well, yeah, because I, okay, here's, here's the thing, right? I, like, I don't know if you've seen my social media feed. I talk about Bailey's and ice cream, right? Yeah. Or, or, or I, I try to be positive. I try to be uplifting. But it's me. It's not – and there are all kinds of mistakes and typos and all that other fun stuff in there. And you're like, oh, my God, right? I, I sometimes look at it like, what, did I, what was I doing on my phone? But it's real, <laughs> right? Yeah. But, but it's real. I'm not – I'm not being something I'm not. People gravitate towards that, right? Because now it's not about... It goes back to what we were talking about earlier with that that balance between standing out and being authentic, right? Yeah. Right, there's a balance. You have to stand out. You have to shout, here I am to the world. Every That's that's the point of social media, especially if you're a band or an artist yeah. or, or, like, or, or an entrepreneur of some kind. That is important. But what's also important is, I don't necessarily like. Okay, I think you're cool. Even if I, even if I wasn't getting an album now, I would definitely be checking you guys out. Just because, dude, man, we talk video games and comics and books and all that other wonderful fun stuff. Yeah. Right. And it doesn't it doesn't sound like our tastes are that different, which makes me feel like maybe there's still a chance I'm cool. It's possible. But anyways, <laughs> um, but. I have a better sense of who you are. Because I have a better sense of who you are, I'm more interested in what you do. Is yeah, that- I, I, I get that completely, but for me, as somebody who's trying to promote a band, yeah, what, what I'm really interested in is all these people who, who follow us. I, I don't like that term because it sounds like we're better than them. We're not. We're just a bunch of guys who are trying to to do this thing you know yes but but what I love is when we post something on social media and it's something like hey what album did are you listening to right now that's really cool and people start kind of applying yeah and I I get to know them they get to know us and it feels more like a two way thing unlike a lot of bands who I see which just post hey we're on tour now Hey, we've got an album out. Buy this. I've got Spotify on my phone. You know, and in the whole social media thing, and the whole way, and the in, and the music industry hasn't caught up to this yet. But the whole way of interacting with a potential audience is changing. Whether it's better or for worse, we don't know yet. But it's happening. Well, I I think better and worse is really a bad term. It's just what it is. Right, yeah. I mean, it's just—it's not even it. Like, okay, like I said, going back to the something that I mentioned, we are thousands of miles apart, and we're chatting. This wasn't possible. This wasn't possible even ten years ago. This is the way it is now, and the fact is, now that we can do this, well, I mean, shit. Look at what we just talked about in the last forty-five minutes. We've gone all over the place, right? Absolutely. Right, right, and and that's. And that's the point. Like, I have this ability to interact with you in a way that I couldn't before. And don't get me wrong, I don't need to know every single detail about you, and uh, and it is probably a good idea that you don't reveal every single detail. I mean, you gotta have some privacy in this world. But all in all, right, there is there is a lot. Like, the cool thing about video games is they're interactive. Well, now, yeah. me, right, the thing about social media is it's interactive. You have the ability to talk to anybody, anytime, any place, anyone, and you have an opportunity to make an impression literally one person at a time, and in a way that that is unique. When you go to when you are on stage, you can interact with some fans. I know some fans are probably a little prettier than others, and they catch your eye. But by and large, it's faces in a crowd, and it's your crowd, and you love them. 
but you don't get you don't get that opportunity necessarily to have that beer one on one or to have that discussion one on one. Yeah. Uh, right. Especially when you get to bigger stages, you just don't you just don't get that chance. Um, but, but when you, there but on social media you get this opportunity like that like like we've been talking for a few weeks now like back around to set up this conversation, but that this this opportunity to do that is there. It's like, hey, how you doing? How you doing? Well, what are you up to? And and we can do that. And that's a very cool thing. It knocks, it it actually eliminates the barrier, the barrier in some levels between performer and audience. It's now it's like, if there was, if it was like a, if it was like a stairway and the performer is, uh, uh, right? Well, the stairs are smaller, right? The stairs are a little smaller. Someone can reach up to you and go, hey, so what kind of ice cream do you like? And you'd be like, well, <laughs> chocolate or vanilla, whatever, whatever the case, whatever your flavor is. What about yours? Well, I like this. Cool. Yeah, that's more possible. That's a really good analogy. I like that. Um, but here's here's the other thing as well. Like we're seeing things like let's plays become really popular on YouTube. Yes. And it's like that gives people, I mean, a way to kind of experience. It's almost like a joint experience, especially when it's on, say, Twitch. Yes. Where you've got where you've got the chat at one side, you've got the streamer, and they're both interacting back and forth, and it's great. I mean, there's a guy on Twitter who's amazing at that. A guy called Crankage Games, I think he's called. Okay. He is amazing with like his fan base, and he actually he doesn't because the fear that I've got with people who gain fan bases is it's it's very easy to kind of start kind of thinking okay how about I ask for I don't know like a GoFundMe or an Indiegogo or something do you know what I mean it's very easy to kind of start kind of exploiting an audience <laughs> okay yeah, that's, it, yeah yeah I get where you're coming from so here, here I have two takes on that just two thoughts one, okay. I, I tend to think I tend. Okay, so here's here, here's the thing that we're in. This is this is the part of there's there are things about fame, right? Uh, fame is the best. It is kind of what you go for as an artist in one sense, but it's also a curse. Um, one hand, if you have fame, you have an audience, yeah. and that's and let's be honest, that's how we make our money. If we get an audience, that is, we are basically going to an audience. You support us so we can continue to do what you guys like. And that's, yeah. that's if you're taking like strictly on a trade commodity point of view, that's the relationship. Which, there's nothing wrong with, by the way. It's just that that's the way it is. Number one. But number two, right? I tend to think that, okay, when... Should I become super successful? Should you become super successful? What's going to be accentuated eventually? Like maybe okay, let's say tomorrow a big record label picks you guys up, and when you get to that whole like that holy shit we're rich, right? Or holy shit we're we're, we're known, and you get you do that drunken revelry, you do a little bit of travel, you do like you do those things that you do when you suddenly have more freedom than you knew what you ever thought possible. Yeah. But eventually there's going to come a point where you're like, okay, you're still going to be the same person you were, but now you have permission to accentuate your good stuff and your bad stuff. Um, I always think, like, I always, the person I want to model if I ever become famous after is Alice Cooper. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Be- because the thing about that guy and the thing he does absolutely perfectly, and this is something I realize. He never changed. He never let himself let his fame change him. He's still the, he's still the same guy. Never had an entourage. He traveled yeah. with his family. He mowed his lawn like everybody else did. <laughs> and there is something to be said about about that. Like, don't get me wrong. We all like look. You you become more well known tomorrow. There are going to be some things, that, some perks that come with fame that you're going to heavily enjoy. And that's not a bad thing, by the way, to enjoy those things. But remember what got you here. Remember 
the biggest thing you gotta, the biggest challenge you'll have if you ever get famous is being who you are got you to that point of fame. And if you, ch- and if you change that, it may not happen right away, but in time you will lose what you gained. And that's, and that's how it works. If you remember that, if you can keep that in your head, um, you'll be even keeled. And a lot of the people that become famous, like some people will get those big meteoric rises to fame. And that's awesome, by the way. But they will lose it simply because they will let their own habits get in their way. Uh, I do, I do, I have six rules to success. And my fifth rule is about when you do it. Okay. So my rules are, sh- first rule, show up. Second rule, do your shit. Third rule, don't quit. Fourth rule, the rest is rain. The fifth rule, get out of your fucking way. And the sixth rule is no excuses. So five, get out of your own way, is not so much about getting success, it's about keeping it. Because whatever got you here, right, be wise enough to recognize the traits that you brought to the table that have allowed you to succeed. And never, ever let them go. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, that that's also kind of given me like this thought about there were a lot of bands who have became famous for doing one one thing. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at I'm looking at bigger bands now. Look at say Megadeth or Metallica, and in the nineties, Metallica brought out the Black Album. Yes. If people people remember that one, and they cut their hair off and they. They basically changed a lot of the things that made Metallica Metallica, but it was really weird because this should have backfired. But what has happened was the Black Album has now become the biggest selling record in history. People keep buying it. It's a good album. It, it, it's it's actually it is. it's a really good album. But okay, but here's the thing about that: that was an authentic thing for them. They're, they're like, so this this is the thing. Right, they didn't change their key components to success, but they changed as yeah. people. But their voice, your voice changes, right? I I always say that when I write a novel, I have three years to write it. The reason why I say I have three years to write it is because after about three years, my voice changes, like because I'm not the same person. Like my, I've gone oh, through yeah. a lot of changes in t- the last two years. I am not the same person I was two years ago. I am just not. I'm, I'm a very different person in a lot of ways. But I'm still the same guy in a lot of ways too. Right? I just accentuate certain things more than I used to. Right? I'm a lot more confident yeah. now than I was two years ago. For a lot of reasons. Um, I'm a lot more... I'm a lot more... I am a lot more what I look at is I worry more about quality than I worry about quantity. And I've noticed that that has created a big difference in everything. And and for me, and so, but these were natural progressions. When you look at them to Metallica from um, Injustice for All, okay, first off, their bass player died, which is a huge, yeah. huge change for them, right? That guy was a bit, was a voice in that band, and that voice was gone. So they decided that they would go in a different direction. And part of it was a challenge. They, they had done a certain style for a long time. They wanted to change it up. And you need to do that as an artist from time to time. It's like, okay, can, I do, can I do it this way? Um, I thought the Black Album was a very good merging of between where the direction music was going in. And it still was who they were in the past. That album is very much a... That album is very much... It's not a weak album. Like the only album I would consider maybe stronger than that one is Master of Puppets. My opinion. Okay. Right. It's the only one I look at. I go. I can listen to both those albums start to finish and not find a bad song in it. Right. If I feel like I'm in a heavier mood, Master's better. If I like, if I want just something that that's hard but not too hard, the Blacks album's better. Right. It depends on my day. Right. For sure. But if you look at what happens afterwards, you look at Load and Reload. Okay, there's only one song on Load I like. It's King Nothing. King Nothing's awesome, but the rest of that yeah. album sucks. Right? But the rest of that album sucks. They went too much. Like, like they went too much in that direction, right? Instead of being true to who they were, w- were they decided that, okay, we're gonna we're gonna become a little bit more pop. They're a pop like, but they're not a pop band. They never were a pop band. 
the stuff that made them stand out, they weren't doing so much when they did load, and reload's terrible. Reload's terrible. Right. I've, I'm not familiar with that album at all. Uh, well, I, I, I'll tell. This is what I'll tell you. You try listening to that album. I, this is what I'll give you. The first four songs, you'll listen to them. You'll like them. You get beyond that, you'll you'll be like, what the fuck? And that'll be literally what you yeah. say, right? Uh, Saint Anger. I was their boldest album. I hate it, but I understand why they did it. And it felt like yeah. for them, for them, it was. A rebirth. It was also like a, a declaration to the world that we're back, or we're going to be different this time. And you look at their album since then; they're they're they're, they're solid. I don't think they're as good. They're, I think they they don't say anything really different than what they said when they were younger, which is why I don't think they're quite as yeah. good. But the tone, the 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 intensity they bring to it, feels more like what they used to be. And that's why those albums are generally received a lot better. So that, that's my opinion, right? It, I think I think it's about art is about the exploration to me about who you are as a as a person. And when you go on that journey, right, you you change. It's part of life. You just you change your thought process. You change who you are to some degree because you have to let you let go of things as you get older, and you and you embrace other things as, as well. That doesn't mean you don't make mistakes, though, from time to time. Um, because the biggest challenge you face as any kind of artist is what are you bringing to the table? What are you saying that's different? What really matters to you now? Is it any different than what it was 10 years ago? Right? Yeah. Uh, um, I'm a Ray Bradbury guy. I love Ray Bradbury. He's my... Oh, yeah. Okay. But here's the thing about Ray Bradbury. Martian Chronicles Ray Bradbury is better than the than the One More for the Road Ray Bradbury, right? One More for the Road was one of his last books. It's still good. It's not terrible by any stretch of the imagination. But he, he was so... He was saying... Like, he was a lot more... He was saying the same things at the end of his life as he was saying at the middle of his life. So the stuff he was saying in the middle of his life meant more because... You could tell it really mattered to him. Whereas at the end of his life, it was like, it still mattered to him, but you just can't put the same passion into it you did when you were really, really into those moments. Yeah, for, for sure. I mean, I see a lot of I see a lot of artists going, uh, I think Tom Elliott from Slayer raised this point, going, we're not who we were like 30 years ago. We, we're not angry anymore you know and that really hit me because I've only ever like thought of Slayer as quite an aggressive band so yeah. for Slayer to like say something like that was quite a it's quite honest a hit really well no it, it, yeah. it's honest I, how can you be Absolutely. angry how can you be angry when you're successful really and that's an honest thing that doesn't mean they can't be fun like 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 um I always look at it this way: if I can't, if I can't be angry anymore, and, I, and this style of music requires me to a certain degree of, ang- of anger, well, I can't manufacture that. But what I could do is I could make it fun. I can look at myself yeah. in the mirror differently. So it may not be at quite the same, but it, at least it's still me. It's still what people expect, and but it's also it's not inauthentic and then that's what I'm going to go back to is you have to be authentic in what you're doing otherwise you you have no business being uh, you, you have no business performing on any of the, and anything uh, whether it's on stage whether it's me reading in front of an audience or what it doesn't matter um, the fact that okay I've done this is going to be like episode 280 of my podcast or something like that okay I've done 280 episodes. If I would, I I don't talk about the same if I, things I did at the very beginning because I'm not the same person. Doesn't mean certain things don't carry over, but the conversations evolve. The the I've evolved, and so what? How I look at things now is not the same as when I started, and it I, there's no way I can be. So I I don't try to do that. I just try to be the best me I can be now. And hope people still stick around. Yeah, I mean that's that's something we always talk about in the band as well. Whether it's how do we kind of 
evolve all of this but without kind of alienating people who has who have been following us from the start which was a year ago it's it's tricky oh absolutely it's tricky to do oh it, it's the biggest challenge you will face in your career right and you have to be true to yourself but you have to you have to some again this is just such a tricky balance going back to the standing out and being authentic is a is a is a is a balance like, like, right, but also being that uh, authenticity has to apply to how you portray your art. But since you guys are going to be metal, right now, you can move towards something, right? You can move towards something, but you can't do it in one giant leap, you have to do it in small steps. Yeah, that, that's the best approach. I mean, with a lot of whatever it is, whether it's just like whatever your goals are sometimes like when you're looking at them I and it's like a massive massive jump but breaking it down just you know break it down keep pushing hopefully you'll get there eventually but if not what have you got to lose really well yeah you gotta go for it life's too short man life's way too short so I don't know about you yeah. I don't know about you I, I think we have a good interview here what do you think Absolutely, man. I'm, I'm glad to have uh, been on. You know, yeah. it's well, first, I, first time doing it. Oh, so so uh, was it good for you? <laughs> Ab- absolutely. Yeah. So why don't we do this? Okay, so this will probably air August sometime or end of July, August, somewhere in there. Okay. Okay. Cool. So do you have anything going on around that time? Um, around August, ooh, yeah, we're, we're doing a few things. We're preparing for our show with Primatai in on which will be on September the fourteenth. Primatai are new wave of traditional heavy metal legends from the UK. They've been around a long time. They're fantastic. One of my favorite bands. We are also recording an album in August, first week of August uh, Tales Beneath the Hunter's Moon which will be out hopefully in November so keep an eye out on the social media pages for that and we are also in a place called Stockton in October, October 11th first time there so we'll see if anybody shows up So, uh, yeah, I, I have a feeling they will so, I hope so how can people find you guys? Uh, we are on Facebook, social. We are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I think we're also on Vero. If anybody uses that, it's a mobile-based uh, social media platform. Just find us over by your leave. We're on YouTube, we're on Spotify, we're on Snapchat. I think you know we're on Skype as well. So come and find us. All right. And that was my conversation with Buyer Leave. Andy was awesome. I really enjoyed this conversation. Andy, you're welcome back anytime. I'm cutting this short because we've gone a little bit long. Uh, so, if you want to support the podcast, you can do so a number of different ways. Support my sponsors, Jennifer Wong, Ron, Andy Imprint. Check out IndieImprint.com for if you're an, an author, musician, video game designer, whatever. They help you promote, design, build your platforms. Definitely check them out. Uh, my podcast, you can subscribe to it. I'm on Podomatic, Google Play, Spotify, iTunes. Leave a comment, share the word, pass the message on. That'd be great. Uh, my books, Watch Your Story, Manson, Wandering God, are available through MirrorPublishing.com. My YouTube channel is Joshua Pentelaresco. My Twitter, Instagram is at jpentelaresco. My Facebook page is Joshua Pentelaresco, writer, podcaster. Thanks for listening, guys. Stay inspired. I'll talk to you next time. Josh. Josh. To the landscape of my brain. I got the spare and speed of pain. Shut the red and drown the bone. There's blood is red from every stone Fucking corpses have set up flesh 
Shattered bone and organ flesh Life is from the death of soul Forced to be a grim hell hole Whoa! Break it down! The door back from life! Darkness inside! Burn the pain and strife! Devils consuming! A thug hangs on high! Devoured by sin! A cruel way to die! My mind clouds the fog to search Is this how it always ends? The signs are there, the lights will fade Dreams don't come worse than any Sleeper's mind Body breaking soul in agony Dreaming shadow death is drawing near Doesn't break sweet life away Break it down The door Back from life Darkness Inside Burn the pain and strife Devils consuming the thong hangs on high Devoured by sin a cruel way to die My mind clouds the fog to search Is this how it always ends? The signs are there the light Yeah.